moving fast, not to let our past survive. Now the John and lots of trouble couldn't say goodbye. I'm gonna be the big end. Killing chances and killing their own lives. You gotta stop, take a look, and then go. You gotta stop, take a look, and then go. This wallet drove from Michigan and Bay. Money feeling funny, think you'll never feel the pain. She believes the better you get, so no matter that you're better again. No one knows you or hurts you, but you hurt yourself the same. You gotta stop, take a look, and then go. You gotta stop, take a look, and then go. I said stop, take a look, and then go. Hi, I'm Magoo, and I managed to sneak into Eddie Fiola's house today to talk to him about his life, his writing, and his career goals in the sport of freestyle for the future. Thanks for having us here, Ed. Hey, no problem. You've been riding bicycles a long time. I imagine you had to start somewhere. We're in Lakewood here, and I know that's your hometown. You've probably got riding areas that you stomped around in the past, don't you? Yeah, there's a place called Kitty Banks that we used to ride. It's a, just a ditch, and uh, that was uh, vertical to us. Yeah? You know, a 45 degree angle, and it was the hardest thing to ride at that time. So that was like the early days of your freestyling, as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Amazing. You've got some pictures you've shown me of dirt jumping and stuff. Now, you never got any press in the magazines for dirt jumping, but that probably goes a long way back for you, too, doesn't it? A way, way, way back. Uh, there's this place across the street from the school, and it was just a big ditch dump place, uh, more or less like Bandini Mountain. We were just jumping into a bunch of Bandini <laughs> stuff. <laughs> well, what made you start riding bicycles? It took a lot less time to get anywhere. I mean, you know, it was a lot faster and things like that. It's more fun, jumping, hanging out, riding. I had a lot of my friends were riding bikes. Well, that's the way it started out for everyone, but something pushed you, something pushed you further. I know Lakewood, the, the old Lakewood Skate Park, is a real famous, legendary place that put you on the map. Where was that, and how long ago were you riding there? I was about 10 years ago when I was riding there, and it was about seven minutes from my house on my bike. I just rode there, rode there every day after school, Saturdays, Sundays. Um, it was just some place that I could go, that I knew that I could ride, that uh, kept me out of trouble. When did the, the, the King of the Skate Park series really begin? Well, when it began is when they stuck my picture in the magazines right after they had done a, a full pictorial of uh, Jeff Watson. And Jeff Watson was like the skate park writer, you know, and they didn't know anybody about anybody else ride the skate park scenes um so what they've done is on the uh the underline they they stuck uh who's better watson or fiola and that's what started the whole competition and then they did another magazine shot with Je uh, uh was it uh steve bennett oh yeah mr bio yeah uh, bio or like bennett that, yeah yep. and then they went into uh um fred becker and they and then morgan you know who's better Watson, Fiola, or Becker, or... You know. When was the first King of the Skate Parks championship? You've won four of those, more than anyone ever ever can or ever will win. And uh, that, that, that had to go back to, what, 81, 82? Yeah, 81 was uh, more or less the first free... No, wait, it was back in uh, 80, they had a, uh, a skate park competition. It wasn't King of the Skate Parks, but I, uh, I had won my, my division. Uh, Tinker Juarez was there, and... And all the big boys. So this, this contest grew from the bicycle uh, racing and the freestyle scene. Yeah. And you beat them all? How'd you do? Well, it was uh, in, during that competition, I was just a, you know, a beginner and yeah. a novice or whatever. And they, they said that I should have uh, went into the expert division. 
but I've never entered the competition. I didn't know what it was about and, you know, mm -hmm. how it was going to be judged or that anything. That was a good decision. How did you do at that contest? Did you win the novice division? Oh, yeah. I won. It was pretty easy. Um, you know, but I've, in the free, what they call freestyle was a, was a pool competition, you oh, know, geez. and they had a slalom course, which was for time, and uh, the slalom course was in, like, more or less a half pipe, and they stuck the cones on the side of the wall. Oh, so you carved inside of a, like a snake ball or like inside of a It was like a pipe. half pipe. It was a long half pipe, and the, and, the, and the cones, the slalom cones, were taped against the wall. You had to go up and over the slalom cones, you know. So what was rad in that day? Now, you know, now it's not uncommon to see guys get seven, eight, nine, ten foot of air. What was really rad back then? Oh, if, if you could get to coping or the tile, you were God. Eddie Fiola, he's last year's reigning king of the skate park. Are you going to be able to retain your title this year, Eddie? Well, I'm going to try as hard as I can. You're second right now to Brian. Do you have a chance of beating him? Uh, I think there's a pretty good chance. Brian's doing really well. Uh, I'm going to try as hard as I can. Uh, how do you uh, feel about this skate park as opposed to other skate parks you ride in? It's one of the best skate parks that I've rode in because uh, it's the closest one around. Uh, who are you sponsored by, Ed? Uh, I'm sponsored by GT, Dino, Vans and Oakley. Hey, listen, how long have you been doing this? I've been doing it for about five years now. Have you ever been injured? Too many times, too many times. How much longer do you think you're going to be able to keep up this kind of competition? Well, I hope I can keep it up long enough to keep my name in there, uh, maybe to come out with a freestyle frame. What trick do you think will be the uh, deciding trick in the contest today for you? Uh, just a traditional one-hander, one-footer, or just grabbing the front wheel. Eddie will be watching some tape of that last performance in a moment here. Uh, how did you feel about it? Uh, it went really good. Uh, I just tried to, to go for a nice high air and to get the crowd going so I can get more points out of it. And then I'd go for something smaller and uh, what are you roll doing here, Just rolling around, doing an uh, alley-oop rollout. I'll do another alley-oop here. Uh, a foot plant, then I'll come out and uh, just start doing like a one-hander here, or a one-footer, and then another one-hander comes up next, and then it'll be a one-hander, one-footer after that. That way, it, things just keep going up and gets the crowd more amped and gets more of a higher score. That's great. Do you think this will be a good enough run to possibly take this uh, cool competition here? Well, I hope so, because this is the last contest that I know of until uh, Bob Morales thinks of another one. And uh, I'm just going to try to do the best I can.
Okay, we've just finished the exciting competition here at the Pipeline Skate Park, and we have our 1983 overall winners with us. First of all, in the 17 and over division, Eddie Fiola. Eddie, how's it feel to win? Uh, it feels really good. I didn't think I was going to make it at first because Brian Dean was doing really good. Uh, he's a really heavy competition, and he's going to going to have a really hard competition next time. Are you going to be back here next year trying to win it again for the third straight year? Every year, every year, I'm going to try. As I remember back in the old days of Pipeline Skate Park, in 1983, Eddie Fiola was the reigning king. He came to the skate park all the time. He practiced real hard. He was the innovator at the, at the pipe bowl. That's where he did his best stuff, and also in the combi pool later on. Uh, he, was, he was heads above everybody in those days. The local Brian Blyther was pushing hard and trying to emulate him, and Mike Domingos was always on his tail, but Eddie, Eddie was really head and shoulders above everybody in those days. In 1984, the competition was tougher, but Eddie did remain, at least to my feeling, still the king of the skate park in 1984. Uh, he was one of the innovators of some of the tricks, some of the fence plant tricks. Definitely got some of the highest air ever in the pipe bowl that I've ever seen. And he, uh, again, to this day, you can go up to the pipeline skate park and see him blasting airs in the pipe bowl and getting real high up in the pipe. I think Eddie uh, showed his class also off, off the... Uh, the uh, skate park surface. He was able to be with the kids, show them how a pro handles himself off the competition, and uh, it was really helpful to, uh, to get a lot of interest in that kind of vertical freestyle in those days. Before we take a look at the second run of the pros, let's take a quick look at the highest air event. We have three contestants in this event, Brian Blyther, Michael Dominguez, and Eddie Fiola. Here he goes, blasting in air, whoa, Ed, yeah, I don't know. What are we, they're marking a, yeah, almost nine feet. Is that it? That's the world's record, nine-foot aerial, nine-foot aerial. Cool, well, Bob, we're back here at the Pipeline Skate Park. It's 1984. We were here in 1983. It's the king of the skate parks. What are we going to be seeing today? Well, we're going to see some of the most outrageous ball riding ever in the sport of freestyle. And as expected, uh, we've got a nice crowd and uh, some good competition going here today. I think we got the pros today, right? Yeah, we got Eddie Fiola, we got Mike Dominguez, we got Brian Dean. We've got a whole host of pros. It's going to be great. So this is the first competition that there's ever been a pro class. Of pro, we've even got a pro purse of $500 for this, for, for this contest. And I guess we should thank the sponsor of today's event. That's Hutch Bicycles. Hutch Performance. He's one of the main sponsors today. Yep. Well, I'm ready for the action. Are you? Yeah, let's go for it. Let's take it away.
the first one is. You don't think it's as strong as your first run, huh? Well, we got to see what the scores are going to be. We'll wait for you and see. Oh, we've got a, we've got a hundred. It didn't feel as good. Didn't feel as good yet. Looks like that's going to do it for you. You're going to win. Going, going back to the competition scene again, I know you probably have your opinions about the competition scene today compared to the, you know, the way it was in the old days. Why don't you tell us some of the differences and tell us a little bit about the way you see the sport progressing as far as freestyle is concerned. Well, like I said before, it was, uh, freestyle was one big thing. It was ramps, pool, ground, everything all at one time, and that was a competition. It was uh, a lot harder to judge because you had to judge all these, mm -hmm. but if you're you know, that versatile, then if you're able to ride all of them, then you win. So freestyle to you then remains uh, that versatility. Then you, you believe that versatility should still stand today because there's yeah. a lot of specialization in freestyle with yeah. flat land and ramps. Would you like to see some changes made in that? Well, I, I think the changes should be is uh, on the pro purse. Uh, I think the pro purse should be a lot bigger. Uh, I think if you're an overall rider, you should get a you know an extra uh, prize out of that because you're doing both. You're riding ramps and ground. And so you're, you're putting out that extra effort. And uh, if you do good in both, and if you win, if you're an overall person, I think you should, you know, get the most money than anybody else. Well, there are some guys making pretty good living winning uh, those overall titles. And many of them probably haven't even seen a skate park, have they? No, uh -uh, not a lot of them. Uh, like, Den I don't think Dennis rides the, uh, rides ramps. Well, I mean, not ramps, but I mean the skate parks and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, well, he certainly had the opportunity. You, this pipeline is someplace you continue to ride even today, isn't it? Yeah, you know, right now it's the only skate park around, and it's uh, the place to have fun, and, and it keeps the kids out of trouble and keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you the f were you among the first riders to uh, take freestyle uh, across, the, across the ocean to other countries? I think we were the, pretty much the first freestylers to do it. It was Bob Morales and I. We, uh, we went across the United States, and then we went into Europe, and we did a, uh, a full month-and-a-half tour you know, through England, uh, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden. Uh, we went to Japan, and, and uh, the only place we haven't hit was uh, Australia. And what's that? Europe must be, you know, a fascinating place. What's that like? Europe's really fun. It's, a, it's, a, it's an experience and a half. I mean, we drove in right-hand drive cars on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, we did a lot of shows to where, I mean, we don't even know what people are saying. Uh, you but, have announcers that aren't even speaking your language, huh? Exactly. And, I mean, they're just rambling on. We're just going out there, and we're doing our tricks, and we're having fun. And the show, just two guys would last an hour long, you know. <laughs> so much adrenaline, huh? Yeah, they, I mean, the people didn't even know what, what freestyle was. So we did the basic, basic tricks, and then went on to a little bit harder tricks. Not like they're doing right now. Um, you know, freestyle has, has advanced so much. Back then, it was uh, front wheel pogos. You know, tough trick. it was hard. It was yeah. real hard. A back wheel hop, um, a lot of different things, a lot of easy things that, you know, people aren't even doing now because, you know, they're so easy. But I see a lot of guys that can't do front wheel hops that are doing bar rides. And yeah, things. that's, I, I know, <laughs> some the people that can do those bar rides probably haven't been told how to do or uh, remember seeing how to do a rock walk even. Oh, yeah. yeah rock walks were, it was how many rock walks you can do in a row. Yeah, yeah, well, there's still guys doing that, uh, doing rock walks and routines. I think that brings some of the fun back in freestyle, yeah. certainly for the old timers anyway. You know, we don't bring our ramps around to uh, the, the shows in Europe and, and things like that because, you know... We are traveling across countries, yeah, yeah. and continents. Um, they had to, uh, we had to call up and say, hey, you know, this is what kind of ramp we want. We want <laughs> an eight-foot tall ramp. And you told with, them this in English. Yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> well, we told them, you know, we want an eight-foot tall ramp, and we even sent them, you know, uh, designs and whatever, and they go, well, what they came out with was an eight-foot tall ramp with, you know, a little bit of vert. This is what we told them, you know, with a, you know, just comes to vert. And they go, okay. So once they, once we got there, we've seen ramps that, that were 12 feet tall with two <laughs> feet of vert. We've seen ramps that were uh, eight foot tall with four feet of vert. We've seen ramps that were uh, eight foot tall with no vert at all, you know, full and on launch ramps. Three foot wide. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah. One of our, one of our shows, and we, we you know, we, we did our best on each one of the yeah. ramps. Um, there was this one ramp was about four feet wide, uh, eight foot tall, and three feet of vert. Man. You know, with, with a platform two feet long. So it was, uh, 
And you did shows on ramps like that? We, we tried, we in, tried. We did our best, you know. In front of how many people? What was the biggest show you ever did in Europe? Uh, in Europe, uh, probably about 2,500 people. Wow, you know, that's, a, that's a good crowd. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, what other doors, what other opportunities has Freestyle opened up for you? Uh, it's opened up uh, commercial work. I've done a couple commercials, a 501 Levi's commercial, a Mountain Dew commercial, Del Monte commercial, and a uh, Foot Locker commercial. Uh, it's also opened up a couple things in the movies. You know, we've done Quicksilver and a uh, movie called Rad. What's it like on the set of uh, like a TV commercial? I've seen your Levi's commercial, and that was great. What, what's it like on the set of something like that? It's uh, a lot different because you're you're behind behind the scenes. You're able to see exactly what's going on. You don't you know you don't see this when you're watching TV that there's like 52 people behind the camera and they're all looking at you, going you know expecting you to do this one thing. But it's great because all the people that are behind the camera don't know anything about freestyle. And you do a front wheel pogo. And they're amazed, going, great, great, that's it, that's it, that's what we need, that's what we need. And then you go out and you do a surfer or, you know, a front wheel, you know, 540, and they're going, oh, my God, you know, this that's is... That's amazing, yeah. time, isn't it? I never had enough shirts, I never had enough shoes, just a couple of pair of 501 blues, that's all I need. You said button fly, I say yes indeed, they shrink the fit everywhere on me. Now I may have to hurry to get some new shoes, but I never have to worry about my Levi's 501 blues. You know, I could use a new tie or two, just to go with my Levi's button fly blues. You were doing front wheel 540s and G turns and that. Did did you realize it? Did you did you know it? Did they expect that trick from you? Did what it is is that when Levi's the way they get everything so natural is that they they don't tell you that the camera's on. They just have they have music playing. They have a couple big old speakers out there and uh, they just have music playing all the time. And they tell you to go back. You know, come in, go back. We're just focusing. We're, uh, this is the director telling yeah, me all this. Yeah, the director things. is just, you know, he's sitting behind the camera going, well, go back, uh, come over. What, what was that trick again? You know, we just want to see that through the camera, see how it looks. And by the time they're done with telling you all this, they're telling you to go home. <laughs> they're going, hey, you know, aren't you going to shoot this thing? They go, don't worry about it, we got it. <laughs> you know, so that's why everything's so natural. It's really cool. Well, are there any other commercials that you've done a, a little more difficult? Were there any uh, memorable hard hard parts about doing TV commercials? Uh, yeah, we've done a... Uh, the uh, what was it? The Mountain Dew commercial, and it took like three days to do a 30-second commercial. Wow! You know because uh, they had a lot more scenes in it, a lot more cuts uh, to different sections, uh, jumping into uh, ice cold water. Is that something you did? Yeah, we did. Well, what it was is that the Mountain Dew commercial, they had every guy jump into the water, and we all tried different things. And the best shot that they had, you know, was R.L. doing his 360, which was uh. You know the best section that that was there, but we all did it. You know, so it was pretty fun, but it was ice cold. So they make you do things that that they can't even guarantee you might end up seeing on TV. Then, right? Huh? A lot of the stuff ends up on the cutting room floor. <laughs> well, I, I, plenty of Eddie Fiola's ended up on the TV screen too. Yeah. Do you have any advice for the kid that wants to put together a winning show routine at these contests? You got to remember, if you want to put it as you know, put a good routine together, you got to do it as a show. You got to have the you know the attitude to go out there and have fun. Uh, don't think of it as a competition. Think of it as, you know, going out there as, as fun. There's a lot of guys that can ride in a circle, you know, a big jam circle, and they do great. They tear everybody up, no problem. But once they get in that, the limelight, you know, of a competition, they just gel. They uh, start freezing up. What's your advice for getting rid of those contest jitters then? I'm sure you've faced them at least once. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's just don't think about it. Just don't watch your other man's run. Just go out there and do the best that you can. Uh, even though there might be 82 people before you, you know, <laughs> um, it's, you're better off just going out there and doing your best and don't think about anybody else.
When you were jumping out of that snake ball in Lakewood uh, eight or ten years ago now, did you ever think freestyle would take you this far? No way, no way. It was, uh, I went out there for fun. Uh, it, you know, just gave me something to do. It was something I loved to do. But I never, ever thought it was, you know, it come this far as to where, uh, you know, big competitions or getting paid as much as I was and being able to have the toys that I have. That's amazing. And uh, freestyle can probably take you a few more years into the future, too. What do you think the future holds in store for you? Well, I plan on doing a lot more shows, uh, a lot more seminars, maybe uh, coming out with some products, maybe even doing a video. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. You've been in a few of those. Uh, Coverage must be something you can never get tired of, uh, and you've got a lot of it, probably more than any other rider in the sport. What's it like getting on a magazine cover? It's, oh, it's so fun. It's great because you're able, you're able to see, you know, say to someone that doesn't know anything about freestyle, and you go into a 7-Eleven a, a or something and say, hey, there I am, I'm on the cover. And it's got your picture That's on amazing. there, it says your name on it and everything, you know. So it's really fun. I've, you know, I don't know how many of covers I've got, but there's quite a few. Yeah, you'd, you'd have to, pro they probably number in the 20s. Uh, yeah. You've been on so many different magazines. You've appeared on magazines abroad, too. What kind of coverage did you get in Europe when you were over there? Oh, uh, Europe. Um, with a lot of media coverage, a lot of TV things. Uh, we've done uh, full-on specials. It's almost like Good Morning America, but it's in Japan or yeah. something like that. And, the, uh, you've done a lot for the sport to help spread the word about freestyle all over the globe. Uh, magazines, articles, newspapers. What, uh, if you were given a chance to convey a single message to everyone who saw you appear in those uh, TV shows and publications, what would it be? Well, what it would be would be if you would start freestyle, and if you, if you like the, the sport and you want to become a freestyler and things like that, you have to start slow. Start at the beginning. You know, wear your equipment. There's a lot of guys that are out there going, well, I want to do this. I want to do a 20-foot air, and yeah. I want to I go out there now. I know that I can't do anything right now, but I'm going to go out there and do, you know, a 30-foot air or, or whatever. And he's out there, and he's not wearing his equipment. He's, you know, not thinking. He's got to, you know, got to start at the beginning. You got to start with the basics. You know, just do an aerial. It doesn't matter if you do, you go out, just do a foot high, you know. Just try to get everything nice and smooth so that you're able to go on to the next day. Start slow and think safe. Exactly. Well, Lem, I want to thank you for having us here today. This has been a lot of fun. Hey, I no appreciate problem. it. That's going to do it for us, Guy. Let's do another thing now. Let's...